Good afternoon. My name is uh, David Wilkove, and I have the uh, pleasure of introducing uh, Dr. Rangarajan today. Um, I first want to begin by thanking the Woodrow Wilson School, the program in South Asian Studies, and the Department of Ecology and Evolutionary Biology for uh, making Dr. Rangarajan's visit possible. Uh, he is a professor of modern Indian history at the University of Delhi, and he is also director of the Nehru Memorial Museum and Library. Um, Dr. Rangarajan is a renowned scholar of South Asian environmental history. Uh, he has explored a, a wide range of topics, really, uh, including such things as human wildlife conflicts, the management of India's forests, the relationship between local communities and the protected areas uh, in which they live or around which they live, as well as the natural history of India, which all of which he has explored in the 10 plus books he has written or edited and in the literally dozens of scholarly articles he has published. Uh, it's an extraordinarily wide and important body of work. And I think uh, Dr. Rangarajan brings to us uh, a, a timely, valuable, non-Western perspective on a set of issues, issues related to conservation, land, wildlife, and people, a set of issues that so many of us care about, but issues that can only be addressed with a profound knowledge of the social, ecological, and historical, and humanistic roots that underlie them. So it is indeed uh, a great pleasure to welcome Dr. Rangarajan today. Okay. Uh, thank you, David. Uh, very, very generous uh, introduction. I, I hope some of it was uh, deserving. Uh, it's a great privilege to be here at uh, Princeton and uh, on what I imagine is a very busy uh, schedule uh, during term, so thank you very much for coming here. Uh, one of the reasons I thought I titled this talk uh, Nature Without Borders was to emphasize that uh, just as we live in a, in a world of uh, perhaps unprecedented change in political and economic and ecological terms, perhaps it is also time to rethink some of the ways in we think about that world. This should of course be evident at first sight to anyone who lives uh, in the early part of the 21st century. Uh, the Chinese have a proverb, may you live in exciting times. And I think we do live in exciting times. Uh, looked at from the perspective of a country like India, or for that matter, a continent like Asia, uh, you are really struck by the transformation, not only of the global economy, but the transformation of the economies of many Asian countries. There's a fascinating recent book by Watts called When a Billion Chinese Jump. It, it is based on a story of how when Watts was young, he says his parents told him that when he prays, he ought to pray that a billion Chinese don't jump at the same time. Because if they jump, he was told the planet would wobble. <laughs> As a journalist, Watts discovered that a billion Chinese are indeed jumping. And he refers, of course, not only to the unprecedented economic transformation of China, but to the enormous ecological costs of that transformation. If you look at World Bank figures, I normally don't go into figures, but I will for just a moment, if I may. Uh, it estimates something like 8.8% of the GDP of China is lost because of environmental costs. So water pollution and someone falls in. Soil gets contaminated, so the land goes out of production. The figures for India are just about as unflattering. The figure is about 8.8%. So what, what happens when you know, a billion Indians are jumping? Needless to say, this economic transformation is to be welcomed. We are, after all, looking at a subcontinent which is part of a global empire, something which will come back when we talk about its politics and its ecological context. And the growth rate uh, of 6 to 7 percent from the early 90s uh, until a couple of years ago, or the growth rate of, say, 5 percent in the 80s, is something definitely to be welcomed. But it does bring with it attendant ecological costs, ecological constraints, so it opens up certain sets of opportunities. It also closes them. The other is, of course, the political transformations that underpin these economic changes. 
Uh, in the mid-20th century, the unification of China under the Communist Party, or its near complete unification, depending on your point of view, and uh, the coming of Indian independence were, were major milestones. In the Indian case, what is significant is not just uh, 1947, the year when the Union Jack was lowered for the last time, but I would say 1952, when the first general elections were held. And the same period I referred to since the 1980s has been a period of enormous political upheaval. Uh, since 1977, when I was still in, I think, school, middle school, high school, whatever you call it here, we had for the first time the spectacle of our federal government or union government being voted out of office and another government assuming office. It's a measure of change that in the many elections since 1977, there have been only two occasions when any government has won election, uh, two elections in a row, and only one of those has been a government which had served its full term in office of five years. So we are living through a period of enormous political vibrance. I must underline here, when I refer to political vibrance, one is referring to voter turnouts, which from the 1960s on were over 60% in southern India, and since the 1970s have been over 60 or 65% at the All India level. I think one of the remarkable features of Indian democracy uh, is, and this has been remarked about by people who study them, we have lots of elections, we have 28 states, so every year you have one or two major elections. We also have elections at the local level. I was just telling a couple of my young colleagues a figure which sometimes they find unbelievable. I have the authority of a former American president who possessed a computer like mine, you know, Bill Clinton, when he addressed Indian Parliament, said India has three million elected representatives. So I went and checked, and if you left out a few thousand, he was very close to the, the correct figure. But I think what is significant in the Indian cases, and it's, it's perhaps a very important feature of India which requires some thought and which will come back in our discussions, is in India, unlike perhaps in the United States, the poorer you are, the less educated you are, the more likely it is that you will vote. I will reverse that. The more affluent you are, the higher your level of education, education, the less likely it is you will vote. This may well be because India is a deeply hierarchical society with many layers of historical inequalities of gender or caste, for instance. And the right to vote is prized by all, but it's particularly prized by those who probably value that voice, the chance to throw their ruler out, the chance to send a very important message. Now, what is significant is that, as with any other large polity, this period of economic transformation and of political transformation has been accompanied also by very intense debates about the environment. One of the things we do know, and I invoke a very popular Indian historian and very pioneering environmental historian, Ram Guha, who, who famously wrote that, you know, the environment or ecology is one of the poster children of the 1960s who is still very much with us. If you look at the late 1960s, it was time of great political upheaval all over the world. Uh, one could look at the uh, movement against the Vietnam War in this country, the civil rights movement, you know, the turbulence in the East Bloc when the Soviet Union invaded Czechoslovakia. And in India itself, it was a time of great upheaval because the Congress Party's majority shrank in parliament. And what uh, Guha says that there were many movements across the world the women's movement, movements for race and caste equality, movements for independence in countries which were still under colonial subjugation, that the ecological question of the environmental movement is one which is still very much with us. Its agendas have never really gone away from the public sphere from the time they firmly got put on the public sphere in the late 60s and early 70s. One can, of course, find early precursors. Uh, historians are trained in any debate to say two things, so I'll say them quickly. If you show us any phenomenon, we are certain to tell you you know, that phenomenon is older. It, this phenomenon has a longer history. It's got a past. The other thing we're likely to say is it's a lot more complicated. So I'm not suggesting the environmental movement sprang from nowhere in the late 60s. I'm just suggesting that it came to prominence in the late 60s and early 70s. Now, in the Indian case, this happened at a very particular juncture in Indian politics and in the evolution of India's economy. The late 60s were a time of uh, intense economic uh, crisis. Something very serious happened. And I think it's important, since this is a discussion on the environment, to explain why it was so serious. The rains failed. They failed not for one year, but for two. Now, India, as any geographer will tell you, has an average rainfall which is exactly the, sad, the, exactly the same as that of our former colonizer, uh, the United Kingdom. It's roughly 110 centimeters. 
The difference as any visitor to England or reader of English novels or even if you've seen a Harry Potter film will tell you is that in England it rains every day and even if it rain, doesn't rain every day, it seems to rain every day. Now in India, we have in much of monsoon Asia, this is a feature shared with Southeast Asia, parts of China, is that there's a very sharply defined wet and dry season. And in most parts of South Asia, much of which is comprised by the Union of India, there is a sharply defined wet season of about three months. Now, for those three months, for two years, the rains failed. And the result, of course, was that the then rather fragile government, headed by the world's only second woman prime minister, the young Indira Gandhi, was in trouble. And they did what countries in the late 1960s did when the rains failed. They turned to the United States for help. And the United States, under President Johnson, uh, provided, if I'm not mistaken, 19 to 20 million tons of food drain aid over a period of two years. One of the results of this, of course, that India became dependent on the United States. And this dependence uh, arose from the fact that, we, that, that India needed the food, but did not have the dollars to pay for them. So the US underwrote it with a loan. It was known as the Public Law 480. I don't know about this university, but a lot of the old American universities, part of the payment was in forms of old government departmental records and published records. You can find them in the basements of American libraries. But one of the results of this, of course, was that there soon came to be conflicts between the Indian and the American government over the course of Indian foreign policy. These conflicts deepened in, in the uh, 1967 celebrations of the 50 years of the revolution in Moscow. The Soviet Union was still very much around then, remember? Mrs. Gandhi was the only non-communist leader to be uh, invited as guest. A couple of weeks later, uh, the brakes came slamming down and the shipments started coming very slowly. In a very famous uh, uh, footnote in his book, Dennis Cox says that uh, Lynn Johnson did two things when he went to the basement of the White House in the late 60s. He picked the targets for bombing the next day in North Vietnam and he slowed or monitored the rate at which the shipments were going to the US. Having said this, one has to give the reverse to give him his due. He exerted enormous pressure on the Indian government to, to rethink its policies on food production. And in a very interesting set of initiatives, which of course had an older history, uh, Mrs. Indira Gandhi got a group of agronomists. She had a former agronomist as a food minister, C. Subramanian, and they put together the bundle of policies which we know today as the Green Revolution. Uh, just expressed in one line, the Green Revolution made food self-reliance its priority. It made production and the raising of productivity its priority. It did this by privileging certain very select regions of India which had good irrigation with high yielding varieties of seeds and all the petrochemical inputs which go with it. By 1972, when the next drought struck, India did import about 4 million tons, which you can see the scale had gone down. And more important, it didn't have a problem with foreign exchange to pay for it. Uh, in a sense, uh, the, food, the Green Revolution had limitations. We are still a society with a very large number of malnourished people. But what is significant is that it gave India a certain measure of elbow room in foreign policy and needless to say in domestic policy, which it could not have possessed had this bundle of measures not come about. What is interesting is that it's around the time that the Green Revolution took, uh, you know, took on some momentum and gathered force that another set of less noticed changes was coming about. These are very central to the issues we, we will be discussing today. In the late 1960s, there was, as you might have uh, uh, guessed when I said she was 48 years old, a very important generational shift in the nature of the Indian leadership. Most of the older Indian leaders, such as her father, Jawaharlal Nehru, her predecessor, Lal Bahadur Shastri, had been very active in the leadership of the freedom struggle. Mrs. Gandhi, since she was born in 1917, was still rather young when India became independent. She had indeed spent two years in jail, but her actual effective political career began not before, but after independence. One of the results of this is that in the late 1960s, while they continued to say that there would be continuity with the past, there were significant changes. The Green Revolution was one such change. It, was, it marked a shift from seeing heavy industry as the major driver of growth to giving primacy to agriculture. When it comes to the field of conservation, it's very interesting that despite the fact that India had a leadership which had led a non-violent freedom struggle, there were very important breaks in terms of the colonial past. There were also remarkable continuities in terms of the way in which 
the most Indian leaders viewed nature and natural resources. So if you looked at the late years of the Second World War, as in many other countries which were at war, India was of course at war as part of the British Indian Empire, there was a Grow More Food campaign. And one of the major points of the Grow More Food campaign is that there were incentives for people who would clear forest, clear scrubland or drain marshes. Now when India became independent, the Grow More Food campaign continued, but it was seen as part of uh, the drive of India to develop its economy. Similarly, if you looked at the India of the 1930s and 40s, some of the far-sighted princes, one could cite the ruler of Mysore, large part of India was ruled by princes, incentivized uh, you know, the uh, setting up of a very important steel plant, which in this case was fired, as many steel plants all over the world were, not by coal, but by wood. So they clear the forest in order to transform uh, large trees and bowls and poles into billets, in order to feed the furnaces to smelt steel. Now in the late 1960s, interestingly, along with this emphasis on production in the Green Revolution, there was a new debate on how to deal with one may call, what one may call today the problem of nature. Mrs. Gandhi, uh, in one of her early speeches, little noticed in January 67, about a year after she became Prime Minister, speaking in the University of the Southern City of Bangalore said, and I, I paraphrase, the drought which now afflicts us may have deeper roots than we tend to think. Uh, forests have been cut down. Many large projects have resulted in denudation of the green cover. These may well be having an impact on the rainfall pattern. Government is now considering steps to protect our fast dwindling forest cover." Unquote. In 1969, she did something which many rulers in many countries now do. She attended a conference on conservation. It was the International Union of Conservation of Nature. It was meeting in Delhi. And what better place for her to go than to the opening ceremony of the conference. In a very interesting speech, she said that we do need foreign exchange. We do need foreign exchange, but not at the cost of the life and liberty of some of the most beautiful furred and feathered inhabitants of our land." Unquote. I must explain that till a few weeks before she gave this talk, it would have been possible for any of you in this room, if you had been around in 1969 August, to fly to Delhi and go to a outfitting firm, pay them the then princely sum of 40,000 rupees and bag within one to two weeks a tiger. They would needless to say stuff it, skin it, preserve it and get it delivered to you at home at, at, at a somewhat trifling extra cost. So this marks in the late 60s a shift from a culture of shikar, the culture of the hunt, to a culture of preservation. And in, in this very speech which I quoted, she referred to uh, the new concerns that the Bengal tiger was in danger of extinction, to concerns about the elephant and the rhinoceros. She couldn't have picked three more fascinating animals. If you look at each of these three, they had a very extensive spread across much of the subcontinent till about 200 years ago. We see a major shrinkage from around 200 years ago, in some cases earlier. So just to remind ourselves, if you look at an animal like the greater one-horned rhinoceros, one of the very large species of rhinoceros, the second largest, I think, it's a grazing animal, lives in wet savanna grassland. And it had a very extensive range. 5,000 years ago, if you look at the Harappan civilization, there are very nice seals. Uh, the drawings aren't always very good, but you can fairly clearly make out a greater one-horned rhinoceros roaming around the marshlands and the grasslands around the river Indus, which is now in Pakistan. You could come closer to today, today and look at the 1520s. The Mughal emperor Ziauddin Muhammad Babur went for a hunt, he says, with his fellow uh, nobles and soldiers uh, in a grassland and forest near the city of Peshawar, which is now in Pakistan. These are not areas where you would expect to find anything like a rhinoceros today. They are drier, but they were probably killed off earlier. Maybe the climate changed. Maybe the landscape changed. It's a similar shrinkage with an animal such as the elephant, or for that matter, with the tiger. Now, the late 1960s to the early 70s, therefore, sees a new kind of assertive India. It's trying to carve out a very particular kind of role for itself. I refer to Mrs. Gandhi and uh, uh, Lyndon Johnson. 1971-72 saw the Bangladesh war, a much, much more serious standoff with the Nixon administration on the liberation of Bangladesh. Bangladesh was founded as a new nation state in 1972 and it has one thing which it shares with India. In 1972, Bangladesh declared the tiger as its national animal, so did India. 
In the Indian case, the tiger displaced an older symbol, the lion. The lion was the national animal until 72. Now, I referred to ecological patriotism, and I'll give you a very interesting anecdote. I mean, I hope it's an interesting anecdote. Dr. Karan Singh, who was a former uh, Maharaja of Jammu and Kashmir, entered uh, uh, politics. He was an elected leader. He was minister for tourism. He was asked to head the Indian Board for Wildlife. Uh, he didn't know very much about fauna, and some a confession he freely makes. Uh, but at the press conference for the launch of a very large federal effort to protect the tiger, to save the tiger from extinction called Project Tiger, he was asked why the tiger had replaced the lion as national animal. And he explained that lions were found in only one forest in one state, Gujarat, the Gir Forest, they're still there. But the tiger, he said, is found in 11 of 16 states. And he went on to say that the tiger is a symbol of the unity and diversity of India. So there was a larger political message he, he, he meant in making the tiger rather than the lion the national animal. Of course, it's important to remember that Project Tiger sought to protect and preserve the tiger, but not in isolation. The tiger was seen as part of a large food chain. Uh, the, by protecting the tiger, you would ensure that it had sufficient prey, it had sufficient cover. And one of the very interesting features of Project Tiger is that it marks, at least in a section of the administration, a shift in the way they viewed the landscape. Some of the areas which were designated as tiger reserves were not mature tree forest. They included the mangroves of the Sundarbans, which spread out into uh, Bangladesh, newly created nation state. They included the scrub forests of Sariska. And they included, eventually, the wet evergreen forests of Mundanturai Kalakad in southern Indian state of Tamil Nadu. Between 1969 and, eight, and 89, therefore, we see a major transformation in terms of Indian government's attitude to the preservation of nature. From something like 1% of the landscape, protected areas first go to 4, and now they occupy something like 6% of the landscape. I think this requires some emphasis. This is a, sub, a country which has 400 people to a square kilometer. That's, uh, it makes it one of the more densely populated countries in Asia. Needless to say, this population is not evenly spread. Uh, but if you look at areas like the Gangetic Plain, you could be talking of densities of 1,000 people per square kilometer. So setting aside, even 150 or 200,000 square kilometers requires somewhere an act of far-sightedness and I, what I would call statesmanship. The tiger, therefore, was in a sense a symbol not only of the older idea of conservation being about megafauna, charismatic animals, the tiger, the lion, the elephant, we can go on, but also it served as a moment of passage to a more inclusive view that landscapes that people were earlier trying to destabilize threaten, destroy, or replace, also had a place, not only in nature's scheme of things, but also in the nation's scheme of things. To illustrate, let me end this by just saying that in 1978, by then Mrs. Gandhi had been voted out of power, but these policies were stable enough to be continued by successor governments. So in 1978, India created a desert national park, which would probably have not been, would have been unthinkable in an earlier era. What happens, of course, by the late 1980s is that to some extent, this notion of conservation, that you protect nature by secluding it, by sequestering it, that you preserve nature by setting certain lands or waters or landscapes or waterscapes aside, began to come under increasing strain. One of the reasons, and I'm sure you can imagine this, is that these areas were in some cases beginning to crack under pressure. Just as in the late 60s, there was a crisis of the endangerment of the tiger so too in the early 90s. One of the very positive features of conservation was that some of the earlier princely hunting reserves where large animals had turned nocturnal because they were intensively hunted, hmm, those areas witnessed a transformation in their behavior. One of the most charming books in India is written by someone whose views I'm about to disagree with, so let me place this on record. It's a lovely book called Tigers, Their Secret Life by Valmik Thapar and the late Fateh Singh Rathor. And it details how three tigresses bring up their tiger cubs and it actually details the differences, not only in their behavior, but what I, I'm not a biologist, so I can't be accused of being anthropomorphic, their personalities. They're very distinct personalities and they bring their cubs up and raise them in three valleys which have fairly distinct microecologies. And all of these observations were conducted in an open jeep with no firearms for protection. 
Similarly, in the Gir Forest of Gujarat by the 1970s, there were lion shows. In 1974, a uh, very famous Indian journalist, Saeed Nakhvi, waiting in the guest house said, Sir, the lion is ready for your appointment and you can see the lion at 4 o'clock. <laughs> and he then was taken to this place where there was a lion and a couple of lionesses not waiting to see him. But they were acculturated enough. They knew they were going to get a bait after the, the, the visitors and tourists and journalists had left. But I think that one of the very important features is that in some of these reserves, we started finding cracks and strains in this dominant model. It happened in two ways. And let me illustrate with the lion first. The lions of the Gate Forest had been under protection from the 1900s because the local princely ruler liked to shoot a few. He also allowed a few guests to shoot a few. Few enough for them to breed and grow in numbers. And uh, in the late 1960s, there had been, again, a scare with the lion, and there had been measures for its protection. In the late 1980s and early 90s, something very strange and sinister happened in the Gir Forest. The lions started attacking and eating humans. There had been only one such episode at the turn of the century. After 1900, this was the first such episode. It's a very interesting set of studies done by my distinguished colleague, among others, Vasan Sabawal, who goes into the gay forest and does a lot of intensive research to find out who's being killed by lions hmm, or lionesses and why are they doing the killing. The first was easy to answer. Most of the people who were killed were not killed within the forest reserve but outside of it. Many were killed at night because it's night. These, this was a time of irregular power supply. Laborers often went into the fields to water the fields. So a disproportionate number of landless laborers were killed by lions because they were going into fields and exposing themselves to danger. There were also others who were killed when they were sleeping outside of their houses within stockades, particularly if they were poor enough not to have a strong enough stockade. Initially, the lions did not enter the stockades to kill people, but by the second year, they began to do so. The study also demonstrated, or at least seek to demonstrate, that most of these attacks came from male lions. So lionesses were implicated in fewer attacks than the lions. And when they look back at the history they found, the previous period, 1890 and 1900, was also a time when there had been two years of successive rain failure. Now, rain failure presumably leads to greater stress in the ecological system and alters in some ways the behavior of some lions. They also suggested that some of the lions which had been habituated by regular feeding and by very close contact with tourists, may have been involved in some of these attacks. Since they were not allowed then to radio collar the animals, these were not definitive observations. But they certainly suggested higher levels of tension between lions and humans than had been seen in most of the history of the conservation of the gate forest. Interesting, the lion attacks stopped as soon as mysteriously as they had started. But what it pointed to was a very high level of continuing human-animal conflict around reserves. It's still uncommon and rare in India, uncommon and rare, to have situations where large carnivores eat people. It is, however, much more common to have situations where large carnivores eat cattle. There's a simple reason. There are over a billion people in India, but India also is home to over 300 million ungulates, which are domestic. It's a very large, lactose-tolerant society. Mm -hmm. About 10 years ago, two colleagues did something very brave, Madhusudan and Mishra. They read up all the papers on large carnivores, triangulated the data, and came up with a figure, which is quite scary when they put it. They estimated that wild large carnivores in India, approximately one third of their diet consists of cattle. That's a very high level of conflict. Remember, these are often people who own cattle. It's a most prized form of wealth. It's important for milk. Or depending on the animal, it may be important for meat. It may be important for dung. And it may be important for hides. So these conflicts began to uh, become sharper. Either the level of conflict went up or the level of consciousness of the people who owned the stock went up. And the dominant system did not have a way of dealing with it. It simply moved these pastoralists out or it tried to close off these areas for grazing. The second, of course, as you might have guessed, was not one of human-animal conflict where the animal is aggressor or turns aggressor in very specific situations. It was one where new kinds of economic forces intervened to wipe the animal out. So the Tiger Reserve of Pranthambur in the early 90s went through a phase when some of the most well-known charismatic individual tigers were killed by poachers. It was surmised that there was a big spike in the price of tiger parts in traditional Asian medicine 
not only in China, since China is always implicated, but by various communities in various parts of the world, including in this country and within India. There are certain schools of medicine such as Yunani which do use tiger parts. There was a similar set of episodes in the 2000s in the reserve of Sariska, where the entire tiger population was exterminated, vanished or was wiped out. Now one answer to these kinds of changes, higher human-animal conflict, whether on the animal side or higher animal-human conflict on the human side, has been to argue that we need better fortresses for these parks. Uh, in 2005, in a very interesting campaign called Kids for Tigers, you can look it up on the net, uh, about a million school children in various parts of India signed a petition saying we, we, we want to save the tiger, we'd like federal government and state governments to take steps to ensure that when we grow up, we can still see tigers roaming in the wild. They had taken Mrs. Indira Gandhi's words, the furred and feathered inhabitants of our land living a life of dignity and freedom very literally. However, the same petition said something else of much greater interest to me as a historian. It said that the forest department staff who guard these reserves should be equipped, should not only be equipped with semi-automatic weapons, but be given the status of federal paramilitary forces so that they will have immunities in case they act against poachers. Now we can debate whether or not armed guards deter poachers, but what we can say with some degree of conviction is it's very easy to induct paramilitary forces into a society driven by conflict. It is very difficult having inducted them to de-induct them. Further, it raises another question whether conservation can only succeed if it is backed up by authoritarian force. Here, I would like to present another story, which is a somewhat more disturbing one. In 1982, in a very interesting uh, waterfowl reserve, not far from Delhi, known as the Killer Dev Ghana, there was a very significant uh, instance of conflict. Uh, the reserve uh, is about 30 square kilometers. It includes large areas of submerged water with reeds and grasses. It also has mounds of trees where nesting birds nest. Uh, in October, the reserve was closed overnight to a number of villages around who had for many years grazed their cattle. In fact, when the reserve became a sanctuary, one of the reasons justifying its continuance as wetland, used as an argument against those who wanted to drain the wetland in order to cultivate it, is that it's a grazing reserve. Not only were these cattle banned, there was an altercation, and the Rajasthan uh, armed constabulary and the police opened fire and nine people died. There were other such instances which have been recorded and studied in more detail by anthropologists and historians. So there is a very big question whether this authoritarian route works at all and whether this authoritarian route is justified in a democracy. Should the tiger living a life of dignity and freedom or the grey lag geese of Bharatpur flying a life of dignity and freedom involve this kind of disturbance to the rights of dignity and freedom of less privileged humans that live in and around these habitats. Here it seems to me that it is possible to go and look at a different kind of approach to how to conserve nature or how to relate to it. As you can imagine, this notion of authoritarian conservation, that you have these island fortresses, which has had adherence of course in many African countries, it has deeper roots within this country. You can't help remembering that the early years Yellowstone and Yosemite were protected by the US armed forces. You can't help but remember that evictions of the Ahavanachi were very important to the making of Yosemite as it is constituted today. But aside from this, there is, I, I would argue, the justice-based arguments or the human rights and dignity-based arguments, very significant as they are in a democracy. It is possible to think of a different way of looking at the problem of conservation, even within the terms that were defined by the early preservationists. After all, the idea that rare species, endangered ecologies, landscapes and waterscapes have intrinsic worth is a significant idea. But is this the only way to realize their integrity? One simple answer would be that none of these reserves is self-contained. Go back to the lions of Gir Forest. There are today around 400 lions. It's one large metapopulation. Over 100 of them are outside the reserve. They have recolonized something like 10,000 square kilometers of landscape, of which over 8,000 is outside the reserve. They're living next to people anyway. So one answer is that even if you make a sharp line in a border, nature doesn't observe the borders. You go back to the reserve of Kuladev Hana in Bharatpur. 
I've been going there since the 70s and one of the lovely features there any time of the year is if you just looked up at the sky, you'd see vultures. And in the 90s, a very important researcher started noticing that there were no vultures in the sky. More disturbingly, he went and counted about 100 vulture nests, there were no hatchlings. As I'm sure you've guessed, uh, there were very important issues of chemical despoilation of the environment and eventually it, it turns out, and there was a lot of detective work involved in this, that it is a very important uh, veterinary drug, diclofenac, which is injected into cattle, which works its way up the food chain. Now, you can't protect vultures by protecting the park. You have to ask, can there be alternatives to diclofenac? At present, there aren't. Diclofenac is banned, but the alternative uh, drug remedies are so expensive that no stockkeeper or pastoralist or farmer is likely to use them. So, nature anyway spills out over borders, and any solution that we have also has to look beyond the borders. The reverse is very important. I go back to the lines of gear or the vultures. I'll just reverse the argument. Ecological services provided by the larger landscape are vital to keep these reserves intact. So unless the vultures can roam and feed beyond the park, it doesn't matter if they just nest in the park. Unless the lions have places into which they can disperse or have contact with other lions, not only in forests, they happen to hang out even in fields in the night, that population will be in trouble. So if we are looking at nature, which has a sense of porous borders both ways. The ability of the parks to sustain themselves, drawing on a matrix of resources. The importance of the wider environment for the animals in the parks. What about the people? And here comes a very interesting point. In the Indian case, unlike in many other countries, most of the parks have people living within them. A much larger number have people dependent on them. I'll illustrate with a very interesting reserve, studied in great detail by my distinguished friend M.D. Madhusudan. Bandipur is in southern India, it's about 500 square kilometers. There's not a single village within Bandipur. Whoever lived there was moved out when Project Tiger began. Those who were moved out didn't get exactly a fair deal. Their conditions of life and livelihood are worse today than they were when they were relocated or displaced, depending on your point of view. But Bandipur has two very serious ecological problems staring it in the face. One is that about 100,000 families draw firewood from it. Now, they draw about two tons of firewood per year for cooking and heating. Now, this is not firewood which is sold. This is not a case where it's market forces. And let us be very clear, irrespective of who rules in the state of Karnataka, where Bandipur is located, irrespective of the party or coalition which rules in New Delhi, the forest department cannot stop those people collecting their firewood. It's an issue of daily need. These are very important citizens, they are voters. And I am sure you know that India is a place where there are more cell phones than people. And they can do something they couldn't 20 years ago, they can call their MLA. In other words, their livelihood needs are directly in conflict in the long term with the ecological integrity of the park. You can't have two tons of firewood removed by 100,000 people having no impact. At the same time, you can't stop them. Similarly, there are something like 200,000 cattle which graze in Bandipur every day. Now, Madhusudan found something very interesting. The explanation for the use of firewood was simple, cooking energy. The explanation for the cattle going in turned out to be much more complicated. He wrote a paper around 10 years ago which led him to change uh, the way he views this particular case and I think there's a deeper principle involved there. He found the major product of the cattle which went into Bandipur was not milk, it was not meat, it was not hides, it was cow dung. And the cow dung was used not for cooking, it was a product which was traded for cash. And it went for growing organic coffee, which was grown in the highlands nearby. Now, the reason these people were so invested in the cow dung economy only becomes clear when one asks, why did they need cash every day or every week? Cow dung keeps, you can uh, make it into flat cakes, dry it in the sun, and it will keep for a few days. The reason they needed cash is something all of us will be very sympathetic with. They were paying a very high rate of interest on their loans. And for an Indian farmer or cultivator, the going loan rate, believe it or not, is 35%. So if you do not address the issues of cooking energy, and you do not begin to address the issues of credit, you will not get a forest where these people will not come in to meet their basic livelihood needs. There have been two kinds of answers. Neither is fully adequate, but they go part of the way. One was a group called Navasangha who began a very interesting scheme uh, to attempt 
subsidized supply of cooking ranges with cooking gas. This has had incredible support from women in most of these villages because it is they who perform the labor. It's a deeply gender divided society of gathering the wood and the twigs that go in to make fuel. Now something like 20 out of 28,000 have bought into this scheme. So it's brought down to a large extent, not only the other 8,000 can't even afford it with the subsidy. It raises a larger question. In the case of uh, Kauda, it's a very partial answer, which is to get a group of farmers together to fence in their crops, keep wild animals out. This leads to not just an increase in productivity, they start putting in a bore well, moving from a single to a double crop. They then start penning their cattle on their own. And they make a shift, or make a very important shift, from cow dung as the product of the cows to milk as a product of the cows. And they link up to a dairy economy, which is very important because milk is now India's most valuable agricultural product, much more valuable than wheat, rice, tea, or coffee. This particular kind of principle, where you look at livelihood being at the center, you look at livelihoods becoming more sustainable, more secure. You look at ways to bring down the level of human animal, or if you like, animal human conflict, direct or indirect. But by addressing these livelihood needs, drawing on a range of available instruments, it could be insurance, it could be better fencing, it could be alternative fuel, seems to hold much more promise than simply a road of authoritarian conservation. In a similar set of initiatives, and over a longer period of time, scholars and uh, administrators who work in the habitat of a very fascinating animal, the snow leopard, very camera shy animal, first photographed in the wild as recently as 1974 by George Schaller. Now the snow leopard has a peculiar problem. It never attacks human beings. There's no record ever of a human being being killed by a snow leopard, but it predates to a very large degree on sheep and goats. And in this case, it's a very different kind of uh, response in parts of Himachal Pradesh, where an insurance uh, scheme has given stock owners some degree of protection. It's been accompanied by very small reserves, four, five, eight, ten 10 square kilometers of areas which are set aside from sheep grazing for which people are compensated. And this has led to both an increase in densities of the wild prey, primarily the bharal, and also a decline in the rates at which snow leopards attack livestock and also uh, some sort of a uh, lessening of the tension between livestock owners and snow leopards. I don't know whether such methods will work everywhere. I'm not suggesting that they are a panacea, but along with colleagues who are more distinguished and knowledgeable, I would suggest that a livelihood-centered conservation uh, approach, which combines the interests of the individual producer with protection of certain collective common goods, in this case, uh, a closed uh, pasture for barrel, but remember that pasture is embedded in a large commons which continues to be used by sheep and goats. Such a method would not only have more adherence in a country which is largely agrarian, which has such a large number of people dependent on direct contact with nature for a living, it would also open up more landscapes and waterscapes where we can try to lessen the negative impacts that human extraction of biomass or changes in the ecology has on nature. I'll end just with one more point, which is that one of the major transformations between the late 60s, 80s era, which was, I think, the high known of the preservation project and today, is that on the ground we are seeing a greater upwelling of rights-based movements. India is, of course, a, a vibrant democracy, but it's only in the last decade that we've enacted very important legislations. A poor person in a rural area has a right to a job. There is a, a, a very important federal legislation on right to education, referring to primary education. A parliament is presently considering a Food Security Act. Within the same sphere, something of great importance for the future of uncultivated landscapes is the Forest Rights Act of 2006. Rather simply put, the Forest Rights Act suggested that if you are from a scheduled tribal family, which can, which can prove residence as of prior to the act, you get rights of residence in the forest and title to about two hectares of land with it. If you're from a non-scheduled tribe family, you have to prove residence for 75 years. Now, what I need to emphasize is that the very large area of forest, something over 500,000 square kilometers in India, has people resident within it who have no rights. They have privileges. They're citizens, but they don't enjoy the rights of livelihood that other citizens do. And this act, in a very small way, puts some sort of a break on not just arbitrary conduct of the forest department, but some sort of a break
on the processes by which government dispossesses and creates a sense of insecurity on, among a very large section of its own citizens, most of them very poor by any stretch, whether you look at poverty in economic or educational terms. What nobody anticipated when this act came into being was that the rules of the act provided for consultation with the village council or the Gram Sabha if forest land was assigned for non-forest use. Uh, in two very important set piece battles, both in the Eastern Indian state of Orissa, in one case a very well known international aluminium company wanted a concession in the Niamgiri hills. It was a very important elephant landscape. It was also an area with two very important scheduled tribal groups. Now this was rejected primarily on the legal ground that these groups had village councils which had said that they would not countenance a loss of their land. Interestingly, the report which was compiled on this did point out that in the same resolutions they said they wanted access to quality health and quality education. So they were not simply forest peoples, they wanted the advantages of the forest with some of the amenities of, of modernity so to speak, but they did not countenance a, a large bauxite mine which would devastate not just where they lived but the land around it. The other case had the opposite outcome, it's a very important Korean steel company which managed to secure. Uh, 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 a land rights concession in an area with a significant uh, presence of owner cultivators, not tribals, who did produce evidence that they were present over here for a long time, but this was overruled by the government because it saw the production of steel as a greater national priority. I'd end, I'd end then just by saying that nature doesn't observe borders, but the ways in which conservation works has often been built around borders. Fortress conservation had its day, it even had perhaps, as many historical events do, a certain positive blessings, sometimes from evil good cometh. But we are today in a situation where one can creatively and seriously comprehend and think of alternative ways and approaches. Whenever I speak on these lines, someone always asks, so I, forgive me, Mr. Chairman, I'll anticipate a question, I asked, what is the right model? And my answer, as I'm sure you can guess, is that there is no one right model. There are different approaches. The question is of principles and the principle of ecological integrity, valuable and significant is, has to be balanced with that of human dignity. In that balance, we will fail extremely seriously if we devalue either. Striving for that balance is difficult, but in our century and our time, not attempting that balance would seriously be not just an error in terms of justice, but also one in terms of the way science and society relate to each other. Thank you very much.